So the elements are line, value, shape, mass or form, space, color, and texture. And where I used form there, I used a different definition. I was talking about three-dimensionality in this list. So we'll start with the most basic, line. It's our basic means for recording and symbolizing ideas, observations, and feelings. Perhaps the primary or first way of communicating visually. The line is basic and fundamental. It's the first mark that we made as humans. In pure geometric line or line with only one dimension, we can't see. So we're actually seeing a stretched out rectangle or, or wider shape. So pure line is just from one point to another. They're linear forms that are just stretched out where length dominates. So wires and branches are good examples. Um, cracks, groove, long narrow depressions are other good examples. And where we see an edge of two shapes together, what we're seeing is actually an implied line, right? So in a work like this, there are no black outlines around all the shapes. We're seeing two shapes abutting each other and making this implied line. And there are different kinds of lines. Um, there's actual line, there's implied line, which I talked about earlier. Um, straight lines and implied lines on C. Um, the abutting edges of shapes in D. Um, vertical lines, diagonal lines, jagged lines, curving lines, hard lines and soft lines, and ragged, irregular lines. Like arrows. Now these are called contour lines. You see how clean and clinical they are? Whereas something like this down on the bottom right would be something called a gestural line. And we'll look at that momentarily. Contour lines describe shapes in a clinical way. Gestural lines show the movement and emotion of the artist. So these are all contour lines. This is a drawing I did. All the lines are straight, very descriptive, right? You're not seeing my handwork in this piece. It's descriptive lines. I'm not wanting you to see jagged or expressive line work here. I'm trying to make a picture. This, on the other hand, is gestural. So this is one of my abstract works. These are definitely jagged, rugged lines. They're not descriptive in the same way as the last. Though gestural can certainly be descriptive, and oftentimes it is. It's just a more expressive way of describing something. Like here. These are, are part of William de Kooning's series of women. Um, but these are gestural lines. They're not contour lines. They show how they were made. So we see the brush stroke making the line. And obviously line is so prevalent in our visual world. So these letters and words are made up of lines more than any other element. We'll look at font and typeface when we discuss design. So there's a video I'm gonna to link to called Helvetica. That's all about font and typeface. It's very interesting and talks about how line is, is related to rhythm really. Okay, value. In our use of the word, Value is brightness or darkness, so not worth. We're talking about brightness and darkness. And you see in a, in a work like this, the abutting values, darkness and lightness, are making implied lines. So this is a grayscale, and this shows an interesting effect. Um, we go from black on the left to white on the right. In the center, the circle is a neutral gray. So it's the same gray throughout all of the squares. But when you look at the left side, that gray looks very bright through contrast. And we look at the right side, that same gray looks very dark. We do an exercise based on this in both 2D design and design color class. And variations in value are how we see changes in objects in space. So it's how we're seeing volume in a picture like this. 
Um, if you just look at the variety of different grays being used here, um, it's allowing us to see these changes in space, changes in depth and dimension. Um, and it's allowing us to actually see where the light source is in this drawing. And you can see that by the angle of the shading up on the rafters, up at the top, and the angle of the shading off of the doors, we can tell that the light source is down and left. So off of the image, but down and to the left. And that's what's making the angle of the shadows up in the rest of the objects. See lots of variations in gray, like on the door surface. Here we get budding values again. The so value is showing us where the light source is, right? The light is hitting the arms and the shins, so we can tell that the light source is up and to the right, whereas in the back, things get darker, so we can tell all of that is in shadow. And we get this, this implied form here, this three-dimensionality of the curving of the figure. And variation of value is what gives that increased compositional effects. So if all of these rectangles were white, they'd all feel like they were up at the same level close to our eyes. But if they're different values, they appear to be in different places back and forth in space. Here we've got all kinds of values happening. Ansel Adams photograph. And this is a great photograph to see atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is where there's a high dynamic range up close to us. So pure darks and pure whites. And then further away, we see more middle grays. And if you look back in here, we can see up close to us, we see very dark darks. but Back into the scene, we see sort of these middle grays. So, so you know from experience that if we go to that mountain range in the background, there will be dark shadows. But because of the diffusion of light, it appears from here that there are just grays happening back there. Um, we also see other things with atmospheric perspective, like, like the crispness of objects close to our eyes and the less crispness of objects far away, right? That's just because of the way our eyes work. We can focus in and see objects very clearly close to us, but further away objects are not as clear. Same happens with, with color and atmospheric perspective. Um, and we'll see that, we'll look at a few watercolor paintings. So, a big point here that we've talked about is that value, value variation shows how light interacts with the objects in the scene. So it's shadow work. So it's how we're able to understand something, even though it's only painted or photographed in black and white. Right? It's not like we need color to understand that there is volume and dimensionality in something like this. See variations in value in that Arnolfini wedding portrait painting by Van Eck that we looked at so much. But here we've got color involved too. So you can see color changing in value as well. So like the greens on her dress, so we've got brighter areas of green, and then we've got darker areas of green, and that's showing us how the folds work. I never noticed that down there before for some reason, that bit of violet down lower on her dress. How could I not have noticed that? You see, when we take the color out, the image still makes sense to us. So there's actually more rods in our eyes than cones, and we'll talk about this when we look at color. But the first thing that eyes did 
in basic creatures was to and does show brightness. So just difference between dark and bright. It's only later evolved eyes that show color. So we still have that in us. Bright and dark are the most fundamental visual happenings. This is the Mondrian painting. <clears throat> and I do want you to write this down, the Mondrian painting, Piet Mondrian, Broadway Boogie Woogie. So this will be sort of our counterbalance to the Anak painting. So we had the very idealized pictorial painting, and then we've got the very abstract, purely abstract painting by Mondrian. And I want to look at this one in the same one we did the last slide. So we see all of the color happening and all the movement created by that color. And that movement is still there when we take the color away and see this just in black and white. So let's look at shape. Two-dimensional or implied two-dimensional area defined by line or changes in value, color, and texture. And we can approach shape in two ways. We can think of shape as geometric, like these shapes, squares, circles, rectangles, sort of hard edge shapes. Precise, regular, circles, triangles, squares, etc. And shapes are what we build with. Usually shapes that are geometric are what we build with most often. So architecture and manufacturing are usually geometric shapes. All these buildings are essentially almost all rectangles. Look at these basic shapes. Hopefully you know these, the triangle, the square, and the circle. So here's a link you could click on to learn more about this <clears throat> Frank Lloyd Wright house called Falling Water. Pretty cool design, really. Cubist paintings. We're all about making what were usually organic shapes into geometric shapes. And then the other type of shape, which I just mentioned, is organic. And most of the shapes found in nature are organic. So they're usually curvilinear and irregular. So I've got to say, though, that some natural shapes, like those in the structure of crystals, are harsh and angular, so more geometric. But most of the organic shapes we see are curvy, and they aren't regular. Here's a Dolly painting. So organic shapes used to purposefully anthropomorphize here. So organic shapes used to try to make these both look like figures. Of course, there's all kinds of stuff happening in this photo, this painting. But I will see that's, that's something that Dali played with a lot is organic shapes to make things look skewed and surreal, of course. Figures are usually organic shapes. Waves, water, organic shapes. And here in the Sistine Chapel, we've got organic shapes being placed into geometric shapes. So all these little scenes happening that are contained within these geometric boxes. We gotta start talking about shape and space together. So we've got positive space and shape. So that's where the subject or dominant shapes are also called figure shapes. So if we look at the sculpture, we understand that the figures are shapes. They are positive shapes. 
They're taking up space. And then we've got negative space shapes. And that's all of the space and shape happening behind the object. It's also called the ground. So we have something called the figure ground relationship. That's the relationship of these sculptures and the air around them. So positive shapes, and then the green is the background ground or the negative shapes, the negative space. So you can see um, like the shape that happens in between the arms. We've got all those little semi-triangular shapes underneath all of their arms. So those are shapes, but they're negative space shapes, whereas the figures themselves are positive shapes. And artists have used this relationship to sort of confuse and make artworks interesting, right? So these are Escher, um, they're not drawings, they're prints, I think. Um, but these are examples where the positive and the negative space is purposefully confused. So foreground is always positive and background is always negative. And he plays with this and he's flipping back and forth what is foreground and what is background. So this amorphous figure and ground relationship. You can see where up at the top, the white space is the background, but then down below the white space is all foreground, is, or not foreground, but positive shape. So the fish down on the bottom are white and they're the figures, whereas up top the birds are black and they're also figures. So it's flipping back and forth what is positive and what's negative. Look at mass a little bit. So mass is three dimensionality. You can think of it as the expansion of shape, right? So two dimensions was just shape. Three dimensions is mass or form. And remember, this is the other use of the word form that we're using right now. So the other thing is, though, we can use mass or form to describe the depiction of three-dimensionality on a two-dimensional surface. So you guys have all seen a drawing of a cube before, and we can still refer to that as mass, even though we're only seeing a 2D representation of those three dimensions. So we can use mass when we're talking about something like a drawing. We can also use mass when we're talking about something like a sculpture. So a sculpture would be actual mass. Whereas a drawing would be implied mass. There's some carving examples of actual mass. These are all in marble. This is incredible. Carving marble to look like fabric like that. It's pretty amazing. And marble is a really great sculptural material as well because it can be sanded. It's really soft. It can be sanded to be super smooth. And it's great for replicating human skin, human bodies. I once went to a place called Marble, Colorado. It's called that because there is a huge marble quarry there took pieces of marble from the quarry. And if we were in class physically, I would show you a piece of it. And on one side, I sanded it with sandpaper and you can feel how smooth it is. On the other side, it's rough like other stone. So here's some implied mass. So it looks three-dimensional, but in reality, it's not. It's a drawing. We've got closed form or closed mass. This is a giant hamburger by Klaus Oldenburg. 
Let's see another one by him when we talk about proportion and scale. So these are all contained feeling, right? They're big and blocky. There are no holes in them. No negative space, negative shape. And then we've got something like this, which is more open form. And we see all of the sort of holes happening here in this interaction with the positive and negative space. See all of these little areas where there are holes in the design. And this one, very open form. So that's it. Um, we'll continue on in the next lecture. And I hope to see you there.